the recording. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so let's get started, I guess. Um, okay. I had I posted the agenda out there. The first thing, um, I guess to go over is just some of the things that we want the some of the goals that we want the club to have, um, and some things we want to work towards. So it's kind of I'll leave it op open to discussion. So. Well, first of all, thank you so much for organizing this. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes. I'm super excited for it. So, yeah. Nope. Let's let Kelly in. There we go. So, anyone have like some ideas, just thoughts about um, general goals? I know um, we kind of wanted I, at least some. I'd like to see a little bit more with quail showing, getting quail into shows. Um, and a lot of people wanted direction with breeding, breeding quail. Um, so kind of, I'd like to see that in there, but um, it's up to you guys too and get some thoughts and just general things written down, so. Well, I have really questions. Hard to... Oh, sorry, Jennifer, go ahead. It's gonna be really hard to do quail shows. Um, I yeah. go to chicken shows and yep. majority of them don't even allow large fowl, believe it or not. They're almost all bantam only shows. Really? Yes. Yeah. Very hard to find a large fowl show. So then the shows are shrinking anyway because a lot of the breeders That's want to keep thing. their a lot of breeders want to keep their genetics to themselves and they're not sharing Whoa. and they're not expanding. And it's really hurting the APA. So it's going to be a rough road to try to add quail in, I think. Interesting. I've I've been to a couple shows in Wisconsin, like the Portage International. Um, they they usually have a decent amount of large fowl, but I haven't been to any of the national shows down south. So That's funny. Well, I guess, uh, you know, a goal could be if, if we can't, think that was um, funny. if it's we really can't figure out, on. if we can't figure out how oh, to get to the, uh, am I getting, I'm getting back speed, I guess, or something. No, I can hear it. Okay. Um, if we can't figure out how to get into the chicken shows, then work towards having our own shows. Yeah. It's chicken people. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you need a poultry club to do a show. And so that requires a lot of volunteers and a lot of organization. So it probably would be easier to piggyback on something that already exists. That makes sense. Yeah. I had talked to um, Richard Peters, I think his last name is, um, who runs the national show down in Oklahoma. And he was more than willing to be um, to help us get quail into the national show. Oh. Um if we kind of like he he wanted a little bit more information and a little bit more but he, like just what our goals are and what we want to work towards um but he was more than willing to open it up to quail as well good he's a good one to to bring on board yeah i guess going a little bit more club wise um what are some things that we want to look towards um doing for the club like i guess setting some um, rules is definitely on there. Um, officer positions, um, all of that would kind of like to get sorted out or at least the beginning of it um, with the meeting. So I had a question. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. I was muting it until I was talking, but um, I guess I'm a member. I'm new to Quail, by the way, as you guys probably know. Um, I started in January with some birds from Southwest Game Birds. Um, but, um, and then now recently Rebecca's words, but um, I guess what my question is for this group is how is this group different? I think that's probably the first thing you need to decide is how is this group different than like a Turnix Corner? Um, you know, the other groups that we have, um, is this group too kind to kind of set some professional standards for for the breeders in the in the country? Um, so I guess I I would start there with the high level. What what is the purpose of
Yeah. Anyone else? I'll let someone else answer. <laughs> well, I think you're going to need the group. Um, you're going to need positions, like you said, and usually the other groups are divided into districts to kind of lighten the load for people asking a bunch of questions. So you could create districts as we get more volunteers to help, but you're going to need a standard. If you can't breed to standard, you can't judge to standard, you can't sell the standard and selling the standard is most of the revenue, I would think. Right. I guess I think what would make set it apart a little bit different, um, Katernix Corner and different groups, like I know the pip, like the virtual show I have is run by one person. So like the standard that we used for the pips and chicks, that was just something I wrote. Other people had input and just like thoughts on it, but it wasn't really a collection of different people coming together. So I guess seeing the group, you know, talking together a little bit more, um, instead of having videos that we send to people, like Katernix Corner has some great educational videos, but it's mostly you talking to them, um, having it a little bit more collaborative and having a lot of the, the people coming together to kind of agree on, like you said, one um, specific standard Yep, so we could take your standard and we could vote on it and put it into place as the standard. And then you could create a sub law that just says if you propose a change to it, then it has to be put to a vote. We can just steal the bylaws from other groups. We don't yeah. Have to <laughs> yeah, and I know Rebecca and Michael, you two were working on a book. I don't know how far that's come. We had talked about it at least for a little bit. Um, that would work really well to incorporate that as well. Because I don't, the formatting of mine is a little bit different. I'd like to see it a little bit more of a consistent formatting, I guess. Yeah, our um, book kind of got waylaid a little bit by um, Martin Yardley's book. So um, I still want to do a book and try to gear it towards, you know, a Caternix Quail SOP kind of thing. Um, but it'll be a while. I'm yeah. really okay. busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can I speak on that as well? Yeah, uh, absolutely. This is Michael, I know my video is not on. Uh, so we're working on editing and, and finalizing Martin Yardley's book. And it's going to be a really good resource, especially for intermediate and advanced breeders, as far as plumage genetics and things like that, and some husbandry issues, ideas for how to start a farm and whatnot. But, uh, standard of perfection and breed standards is probably a whole other book. And honestly, we can start working on standard of perfection as a general breed, treating all caternics like one breed. But as far as separating different breeds, I know at our farm, we're just not there yet. I don't, I don't want to jump the gun and do things too early and then have double mating become an issue in quail like it has in so many different chicken breeds. So we just need to be really cautious when we're defining any type of breed standards to make sure to thoroughly vet it and actually have proven techniques and standards in place rather than just coming up with something off the top of our head from what we think looks good. Absolutely. I think that's a very responsible way to approach it. Okay, let me interject here. Um, you, Michael and Rebecca are gonna speak from breeder standpoints when you go into shows show people have different agendas. They will cross anything to make it look better to beat the next person. So it breeding to standard is very different than breeding to show, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So yeah. you have, if you're gonna do it, you need to make a standard, which is not my thing. That would be y'all's thing, but not put that in place thinking that that's what you're going to see at this show necessarily. So I'm glad we have all these different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hang in a little bit there. I'm newer to quail. Actually, I've only not even been in it for a full year, but I raise uh, dairy goats and I'm in the American Dairy Goat Association and they're standards are super strict um they have what's called a grade and american system 
or an experimentals where if you cross two breeds, they are then registered as experimental or grade. So it, it's marked that they are a purposeful cross. You're trying to combine these things. So we could have a system like that. And then like, if you breed American back to purebred for three generations, the babies are now purebred instead of American. So we could set up something like that, where if people want to play around and do the crosses, just have a whole separate category for it. In birds, I don't think it would be fruitful to have a registry. I'm in the goat right. registry also. I don't think there's a way, you know, just for example, if you have, I have Buff Orpingtons, if you want Fluffier to win at the next show, you'll breed in some coaching and try to breed it back out to get the fluffy feet out and you'll pluck the, fuck, the feet feathers and you're cheating. It's completely cheating, but that's mm. what you're going to see at the show. So I don't you, know poultry don't shows. So. <laughs> well, you don't want to register that is what I'm saying. You don't want anybody to know that that's what you're doing. I don't do that. Oh, but okay. You sure not go put it on yeah. paper. The good news <laughs> is, is that we're working with one breed. They're yes. just different colors of the right. same breed, different sizes, whatever. But it, at least we're not crossing breeds. So that that does help. The hardest thing, at least for me with the virtual show, um, was trying to figure out class wise too. Um, I know with the Australian show, um, they do a ton of different classes. So they've got a class for just about every single one of the more popular varieties. Um, but in a chicken show, you know, there's only five or six classes max. Um, and then the classes get broken down by breed, which we can't really do because we're one consecutive breed. Um, but we can break it down by variety a little bit, but then how you want to keep breaking it down because there's no way to say like, okay, you know, if you have silver and sparkly, you can have both on the same bird. You can't have both on the same. It's a little bit more accepted to have two different varieties on the same bird for Caternix than it is on a chicken. Well, I would suggest that we just start with maybe six varieties, not be overwhelming, and maybe just add them and as the group grows. Yeah. Does six mm -hmm. seem like a reasonable number, Rebecca, Michael? I I would say, you know, starting with kind of the, the basics, you know, Pharaoh, E B and Fawn. Um and you know building from there uh, that that makes the most sense to me so three varieties or that could be broken into five depending on how you look at it so how you wanted to go about it isn't that what you're doing um brie with the um virtual show isn't there just five yeah. well, we've got one, five we've got five and then a sixth for one that have any other dilutions on them Right, the open. So um, I guess when I first started learning about quail, I thought pansy was considered a, a base color, but maybe that was, I think on Allie's website, I think I read mm -hmm. that. Is that not, it's not really the case anymore? Mm -mm. Not really. Michael, yeah, if Can you I want to pick to that, that up. <laughs> yeah, so the classification on plumage based on patterns and uh, dilutions is not consistent from country to country. And basically there's two genes that are really affecting pattern dramatically. And that's sort of been dubbed base patterns and then all the dilutions can play on those. But um, contrasting that to more developed industries where there's breed standards, those are really just affecting the plumage color. So the plumage color and pattern. And I'm wondering if it would be more fruitful to start with type. So maybe an egg type and a meat type or size. So bant bantam standard jumbo, because that really affects the overall health of the bird and how it's bred. But that's a conversation we'll have to have. Do we, do we go based on what the bird is bred for or do we go based on the plumage genetics alone? And uh, I'm not really sure which direction we wanna go or how to start. I think someone who has experience maybe with some of the other successful groups with other species might be able to speak to that a little bit better. Good point. So you would do breed with varieties and you would do bantam and large fowl in a chicken world. 
So then would you can would you consider Coturnix then just one breed with a ton of different varieties? It's definitely a direction we could take. Um, I, I kind of see it. Small. I kind of see it as you have, you know, the, the breed itself, you know, you have Coturnix right. and then you can break it down into jumbo standard phantom. And then from that, you know, there's all the different colors with, within those. Um, or the way, you know, Michael put it, you could also look at it as, you know, what their purpose is for meat or eggs. Um, there's that as well. But I, I kind of see it as, you know, going from just, you know, it, the overall breed into the size categories. Because that's, that's how it is with chickens. It's, you have you know, chickens are broken into, you know, bantam and large fowl or whatever. And then from there into the separate breeds, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also kind of what their, their purpose as well or yeah. where they originate. No. Not in the SOP, they're not divided by egg or meat. Some of them are classified as dual purpose, but that's in the description. Got it. Okay. They do, um, going off of that a little bit, on some of the smaller shows, like if you go to a county fair, um, they'll have additional classes for production birds. So that'll be like your like your, your high lines, the production birds that you'll get from a hatchery. And those will be judged more on like their laying capabilities, but there's not a specific standard written out for that. And that's really only for smaller shows. They don't have that in this like American standard of perfection at all. No, no. Well, if I am to propose something, I would say I can pull, I'm assuming I'm the only one here with the SOP. Does anybody else have an SOP? You I I do. do. <laughs> okay, so we can just pull the information out of there and just kind of fill in the blanks. Um, and not really start from scratch just kind of steal their stuff and start from there for those of you who are in the in the chicken world sop stands for um, standard of perfection it is a it is a big book with a whole bunch of chicken breeds saying this is how the breed should be so that's mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about it's for the american poultry association do you want to start there yeah i think that would be a great great thing to start with just Bring, bring it forward if you want to either post it in the group or um, bring it up. We, have, let's, we can also figure out when the next meeting is going to be, um, what day, time works for people. Um, that's probably a good thing to bring up right away. How often do you want to meet? That was a great question. <laughs> um, who, who would ask that? I think Will, William Foster asked that one of the, was one of the first things like how often do you meet and I'm like I don't know yet <laughs> let us have the first meeting first <laughs> yeah the the chicken poultry clubs they meet once a month usually yeah that's what I was kind of thinking do I don't know if we want to meet more often just while we're getting started to get some things established and then go to kind of once a month I know some of the bigger groups meet even less than that but it's up to you guys. We could probably get a lot of stuff done by posting it in your Facebook group and filling in the blanks. And that way a lot of that gets done and not necessarily in the meeting beforehand. Okay. Does that seem reasonable? Yeah. And then we can kind of just recap all of that and go over it um, in the meetings just to make sure everyone's on board and everyone sees that mm -hmm. and is okay with it. Um, as far as um, membership goes, um, do we want to have just some base guidelines on, um, I've kind of been accepting anyone that answers the questions on the Facebook group, um, but do we want to kind of set, I guess, parameters on, on that a little bit more? Well, I was thinking today, I would make some notes. Um, again, to, it goes back to what's, it, what's the purpose of this group? Um, is it to be kind of like a leadership group for 
um, quail for new people that are getting into breeding. Um, and then one of the things I thought of is maybe even have a code of ethics for like, you know, have someone commit to uh, a promise that they won't, you know, be a multiplier. There'll be a selective breeder and that they'll try to uphold whatever the standards are that are developed for this group. But, you know, just basically the members have to agree to a certain, you know, promise right. to standards. That, and I know it would be helpful to have in an actual like list, whether it be a spreadsheet or a form they fill out with name, email, like location, like what state or what area of the state, just for other people to look at kind of, you know, this is a list of the breeders that are in this. If they've got, if we ended up going with, you know, this is like um, something that they have to agree to, like a breeding towards a standard or something. Um, yeah, just so that people kind of know. As far as letting people in the Facebook group, I'd almost say halt that until we get organized a little bit. And if we're going to, like, if I write up what the standard should be, but leave the blanks for everybody to kind of collaborate and fill in, if I post go. that, we don't want Billy Bob down the road putting in there that you know, his pheasant should be on there too. So we might keep it kind of confined until we have some things gelled up a little bit. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that's what I was kind of thinking. It's just hard because I also want people in, in this, in, in the breeder group that can put input on it. And I know I only know some people, I know other people know other people. So it's just kind of been, okay, let's get something established, I guess, at what who we want to be able to give that input and get kind of the starting stuff down. Okay. We want to do nominations yes, for, for some mem board members and then during the month and then vote on it at the next meeting. Yeah, that'd be a great start. Okay. Um, major officer roles are um, president, vice president, secretary. Um, sometimes they have a social media representative and definitely a treasurer. So if you know anyone that wants to be um, in, in a leadership role, kind of either say it now, say it in the chat. Otherwise, I'll put a Facebook post out um, and people can comment on there too. And then we'll do an official, I'll send out an official Google form and people can vote. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of stepping back to the, what's the overall goal again? Uh, when we are wanting to like start getting members and all this other stuff, what are what are people getting for their membership fee? Are we gonna have a directory? Are we gonna have like, you get a little certificate to put on your wall saying you're a member? Like, yeah, why, why are people gonna wanna be in this basically? Kind of again with the goals, what is the? Yeah, well, I, think I think we're have a all breeder. Right. I think we're all kind of in, in agreement that we want to be breeding towards better quail, um, better, stronger, healthier quail. And I think that's kind of a baseline goal. And then the, the club is really to help put a little bit more guidelines to that, or at least give a direction for some people that may be looking for it. Okay. I say, Cal um, Kelly, I saw your comment in the chat. So anyone who's not opening the chat, she asked, um, which big NPIP breeders have been invited? Um, I invited pretty much everyone I talked to. So uh, most of you guys here. Um, I also invited um, Whiskey Tango Farms, uh, William Foster, I'm trying to think of other people. Yeah, I sent out a whole bunch of messages.
Um, and you can unmute by, um, if you move your mouse, it should be down on the lower left-hand corner is where you can mute and unmute. Oh yeah, I figured it out. My phone was being weird. I'm on my phone. Ah, I got it, okay. So it was being weird. What else was on your list? Because I can't see the list anymore. Um, can pull it up again. Carrie, it's great to see you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just in listening to see what you guys got going. As soon as you get everything figured out, um, Bree, if you want to do something on a live stream or something, maybe we can get it out to more people. You know, absolutely. And on the Facebook group pages, obviously. I think once we have it established and kind of the main guidelines, the main roles, what membership all means, sure. can definitely. Sounds good to me. Yeah. So that was one of the things for membership dues. Um, if we want to talk about that. I think we need to get a little bit more established before we actually put dues in place. For sure, definitely have a treasurer and a secretary figured out to help sort that through. Um, yeah, most of the thing I had was goals for the club, meeting dates and times. Um, do we want to set a meeting right away? Um, we said like about once a month. You want to do the first Wednesday of every month? Absolutely. Everybody give that and other his. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll we'll have it the first Wednesday of every month. Does five o'clock Central Standard Time work for everyone? Is there a better time that works? It's fine for me. Okay. Um, someone sent a message. Yep. Okay. So we'll go with that then. Um, and five the first Wednesday of every month at five um same thing with the zoom meeting um i just got a notification we have 10 minutes left so it goes for 40 minutes that's probably a good time to be productive and not go over and just ramble on about things so does it cost money it does not okay um yeah, the only other thing I had, um, getting it out there, so promotions. I know you had reached out, Jennifer, about um, like putting a website and a logo together. Mm -hmm. um, are you guys all okay with the name? I guess I never asked that, but <laughs> the American oh, Catering Readers Association. Yeah. Do you, I guess the only question would be Caternix could potentially, you know, there's other you know breeds out there that are called Caternix do you know I, it's pretty much well known that it's you know Caternix is C Caternix japonica but I don't know if you you know if anything needs to be added for that I'm just throwing that out there I don't care just for the sake of lettering what about the AQA American Quail Association yes you got the ABA the APA you can do the AQA the only thing I have with that is I have a lot of people asking about um, Bob Whites yeah, and other breeds. Um, yeah. Well, the answer would be they're not recognized yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're in charge and we can say that. <laughs> I'm okay with either. So if you guys would rather have AQA or um, ACBA, up to you guys. I like uh, it. ACBA is fine for me. Why don't you put it to a poll on the on your Facebook group? There Sounds go. good. I'll yeah. throw that out there before I forget. Yeah, and then do the nominations on another post, and then I'll type up the a blank standard per se, and people and we'll post it, and people can be filling it in before the next meeting. Awesome. Because I'm by no stretch the genetic person so I'll just do the typing part if you want me to good deal that would be great yeah um so just some things we covered first Wednesday of every month um general we're going to put a standard together 
I'll put the two, the post out there. I'll do a separate poll for each role. Um, just, just so that that's out there and then you can nominate, you can just write people in for the poll. Um, that's going to be open to everyone in the group. There's like 98 people. Most of the people weren't here. So maybe something to consider and we'll bring it up at the next meeting just to confirm, you know, everyone's okay with these people. And, you know, we don't have someone that wasn't at the meeting or doesn't, has never done anything with quail in a role that, um, and then, yeah, no, that's pretty much everything I had down. Is there any other big topics people want to cover? I think this was a good start. Yeah, me too. Awesome. So I will end the meeting then and put it all out on Facebook and we can meet again in June. All right. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jennifer, by the way. You're welcome. Thank you, Bray. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see Thank you guys. You guys. Have a good one.